All right, welcome. Today we're taking a look at Trampoline RTOS, which is a real-time operating system. Last time we looked at um, the uh, other RTOS, free RTOS. Um, and so this is in a similar vein. I had requests for both. So uh, I figured we should do them one after the other. I had intended to not take as long as a break as I, as I took for winter break, but I'm not in control of everything, unfortunately. So, um, so here we are. Uh, one more thing I want to add before we get started is that um, for now, I'm putting a pause on uh, taking requests. As I mentioned in the free RTOS video, my, back, my backlog is just too big to keep adding to it. And so I want to burn down that queue. And then um, once that's in a more manageable state, I'm going to figure out another way to do requests uh, just so that I don't get uh, DDoSed, essentially. Hello. Oh, this uh, window is not going on top. Let me see if I have another way of showing this chat. Hello, R. I'm glad you got a notification. It seems like some of my uh, streams uh, were not notifying people or something like that. Um, let's see, more actions, keep on top. You're not gonna stay on top? All right, well, whatever. All right, so I can't show uh, my chat the usual way, but we'll we'll find a way around it. Okay. Um, so free RTOS, I think this is about the same size as, uh, sorry, uh, trampoline RTOS. I think it's about the same size as, as free RTOS, but I'm not sure. We have some C++, but mostly C, and then a little bit of assembly. I imagine the assembly is going to be part of the glue that holds together the, um, the, uh, you know, uh, when you do an implementation for like a particular uh, chipset or CPU, um, then I think that that's maybe where most of the assembly is going to come in, but we'll see. Um, let's see. I have no idea what AutoSAR is. Com, I'm going to guess is um, maybe like Windows Com modules or communication. Uh, let's I guess open these two up just in case they contain anything interesting that um, that I, uh, that I should see. Debug and documentation we're going to ignore. Examples might be worth looking at. Extra will ignore. Goyle, I think is a is a fundamental part of this, but I'm not sure. IOC, I don't know. We'll look at it. Libraries is probably important. Machines, I'm going to guess is possibly where they put the stuff that adapts um, the RTOS to uh, trampoline RTOS to a particular implementation. And then we have OS which I'm going to guess is the main thing. Viper could be a just a tool. Viper. Ooh. Well, we'll, I guess, maybe ignore Viper for now and open OS. So I'm guessing OS is the main place to be. The OS directory, kernel, and OSEC services. What is OSEC? I don't know. Um, but we have the following functions. So TPL as memmap, which is a wrapper mapping a wrapper for memory mapping of assembly source code. Okay, so I guess this is probably translating whatever the chip does uh, for memory mapping to uh, a standard, standardized, ver standardized version so that the kernel understands it. Um, we have a wrapper for compiler-dependent macro and default definition for POSIX. So this is like the chip is, I guess, implementing some part of the POSIX spec as uh, macros, and the kernel needs to, you know, we need to, to wrap that stuff so that the kernel has some um, ability to understand it. Stuff for checking if the configuration is okay. I don't know if this is what kind of configuration it's talking about. And then uh, macros related to the target platform. So this sh this should be for customizing to the I guess they call as you would make sense uh, the uh, the chip that you're porting this to the target. Um, a dispatch table. This is presumably for dispatching functions based on, um, oh, we'll see, but I'm guessing there's some like main control loop tick processor thing, and it's going to, uh, on certain events, dispatch functions, but we'll see how it's implemented. And then we have the low level kernel functions and scheduler. Okay. So this is where I want to get, let's see if we can dispatch some of these other folders relatively quickly. Com. Do we get a readme in com? No readme in com. What if we pick out a 
combase.mo underscore mo. Uh, prototype for copying functions. Sending message object based data structure. Internal and external communication based data structure for sending message objects. So I guess com is probably stands for communication and is about message, um, message passing. API com message kernel. Okay, so that's potentially interesting. We may not get to it. Autosar. I don't know what Autosar is. Let's see if Autosar is a thing. Autosar. Okay, so this is automotive stuff. Um, that's potentially interesting. Examples. Let's look at one quick example. What do we care most about? Maybe ARM. ARM is cool these days. I don't know what these ARM things are, but presumably there's some sort of chips. How about a demo car? Uh, Bluetooth. What is it? Let's look up next. Next arm. It's a robot arm. Okay. Or no, no, no. Maybe it's like a, uh, next chip. Maybe it's like a hobbyist, uh, robotics chip. Is it NXP? NXT, not NXP. Maybe Wikipedia. An open source cryptocurrency. Nope. Um, Lego Mindstorms. I'm guessing it's referring to this. So I don't think I need to see Lego Mindstorms as cool as it would be, as it is. Yeah, I guess let's do that. Never mind. Um, but let's look at simple. Just in the interest of our first example being relatively simple. Oil. So oil is possibly related to Goyle. See if we see any goyles in here. No. Okay. Here's next IRQ. This should be interrupt stuff. Got this funk macro, and it, it it takes a void in an OS code, I guess, and it's returning a void. And it's a TPL arm sub arc IRQ handler. So this is some handler. I'm guessing this macro is essentially registering, um, registering this code somehow to something whatever OS code is, do we get a definition? I don't know, but uh, we've got this var st um, stuff. I assume this is also a macro. When the processor reads AIC IVR interrupt vector register. So I'm guessing this is a register on the next thing. The value written into AIC SVR corresponding to the current interrupt is returned. So Whatever this vector register is, maybe this just means that there is a thing for you to look at. And then you look into this, this is like the mailbox where you look. Um, at any rate, uh, we've got this var is an automatic, whatever that means. I'm guessing you and I, uh, 16 is essentially the type of the, of the var. And we're going to get the set the ISR ID to the thing in this, um, AIC IVR, which is um, where we're supposed to look for interrupts uh, under our current theory. And then we will find the interrupt peripheral ID. So, uh, after we've fetched this variable, it looks like we set it to this flag and then we set ISR ID to the, uh, I guess what's, whatever is in this AIC ISR which is what did we see ISR already? I don't think so. Uh, and then we launched an action, I guess, using a timer, whatever ISR two is. And we're going to set this, I, I assume this syntax means we're going to set this handler vari variable to the ISR vector and looking in the vector using the ISR ID, which we got here, we're going to call a function early or maybe assign ISR vector to the function. And then we're calling, I guess, that function with the vector index of ISR ID and the arcs. So this is just some kind of like arcane calling convention uh, that to to um, uh, handle the fact that uh, you have to fetch things uh, essentially from the registers of the chip on a per implementation basis. And then we're going to acknowledge the interrupt. So where did SVR come in? 
Uh, it says in the comment that we're going to use it, and then I think we don't use it. I don't know if that comment's out of date or if I'm just misunderstanding, but that is at least tells us a little bit about what the usage of this stuff is. Here is Goyle. Goyle. Goyle is the oil compiler of trampoline. To compile Goyle, you need some stuff. What is oil? Let's see if we can find out. Oil uh, trampoline. Ultimate guide to trampoline care and maintenance. Uh, how about Arthos? The oil language. Come on, Cloudflare. Hmm. Let's try Google. Goyal oil trampoline Arthos. OSEC implementation language. There we go. OSEC. OSEC is the Offing System und deren Schnitzel Schnittstellen für die Elektronik in Kraftfahrzeugen, open system and their interfaces for the electronics in motor vehicles, is a standards body that has produced specifications for an embedded operating system, a communication stack, and a network management protocol for automotive embedded systems. It has produced related specifications, namely Autosar. OSEC was designed to provide reliable standard software architects for the various electronic control units throughout a car. Germany. I haven't looked over here, but I'm going to guess it's um, Daimler Chrysler or, or something BMW. Okay, BMW, Daimler Chrysler, Opel Siemens. Siemens and Opel I recognize as separate groups. I didn't realize that they were maybe merged. Siemens. Opel car. And Volkswagen. Volkswagen. I guess Opel still makes cars. Do they make old cars? Yeah. Okay. This is a cool car. All right. So that's what that's what we're looking at. I guess uh, oil is something related to car stuff. And we have this um, Goyle file. Dot one. I'm guessing it's the man page. Okay. Um, so do we want to read anything in here? I guess I'm going to ignore, uh, Goyle for now. IOC. I don't know. Special character is used for SVN integration. So SVN is probably a subversion. So maybe this started as a subversion repo. IOC. Um, IOC embedded systems. Interrupt on change. Let's look that up. My parents are aliens. That's not what I wanted to search for. What's the difference between interrupt on change and external interrupt on PSEs? Uh, okay, so these are, I guess, different um, interrupt strategies. Interrupt on change, I'm guessing there's some value, and when it changes, you get an interrupt. And external interrupt, I'm guessing there's some input signal that allows you to uh, cause an interrupt. Will archive.org work? Thanks, whoever this was, for linking to the archives link. Okay. Interrupt on change, sleep mode, and watchdog timer. All right. Um, feature is similar to the... So interrupt on change is similar to the external interrupt facility covered in Lesson 3, except that a port change interrupt will be triggered by any change, not just one type of transition, on any of the pins for which it is enabled. This... Uh, makes it more flexible being available on more pins, but also more difficult to deal with correctly, as we shall see in the examples in this section. So I guess you have pins and they have some elect electric signal on it. I'm not um, an EE person. I've never took, I've never taken uh, any sort of embedded or EE courses. But I'm guessing the way it works is you have some sort of voltage applied to the pins 
And maybe when the voltage changes by a certain amount, then um, that's detected in an interrupt descent. And then I guess one of the reasons it's complicated is because um, as a user of whatever chip uh, this is, you, uh, I guess the flexibility of allowing any uh, pin to detect a change means that you can implement all sorts of things, but then you have to take care of the fact that maybe you only wanted one pin to detect the change. You have to somehow uh, add logic that ignores other detections or something along those lines. Okay, here's the libraries directory. We get net and drivers. Drivers, I'm going to guess, are drivers. These are things like Ethernet, um, some port stuff. It looks Ethernet-y. And, oh, this is, um, I guess this is the lightweight IP. So is that what's going on? Yeah, so I think I did, um, I did a video on this. That you should watch. Some lightweight TCP IP implementation, but we'll ignore it for now. And then here's machines. These are, I suppose, going to be the, um, the customizations of trampoline RTOS. So let's look at uh, something, maybe another arm. ARM 926, I don't know what that is, but I guess we'll look at CPU cache. That seems fun. We've got this extern func thing. So we've got this func macro. Again, um, it takes OS code as the second argument, and I'm sure we'll see the func implementation. And uh, this is just setting up essentially the, um, the, the names of the things, and they'll be implemented in this C file. Okay, so here's cache on. It's going to call some assembly. Whatever Merc is in OR, let's ask, um, let's ask ChatGPT what this assembly does. What does this snippet of assembly code do? Okay, so it recognizes that it's ARM. So the MRC line performs a coprocessor to register transfer from CP15 to register R0. It reads the value in the system control register from the coprocessor register one opcode zero and writes it to register zero. The next line, the ORR provides, okay, so OR must be bitwise OR. Maybe everything is three letters and that's why we have two R's, setting a specific bit, bit 11 in register R0. This bit corresponds to the I instruction cast enable bit. So I guess this is enabling the instruction cast, which is what I think the function said it was going to do. And then we do another bitwise OR uh, that corresponds to the C data cache enable bit. So we're enabling the C data cache. And then this MCR uh, does a register transfer from uh, R0, which is, I think, where we were doing our work, to CP15, which is where we started. It writes the modified value of R0 back, the SCLC, sorry, SCTLR. Okay. Um, it basically in, does what it says on the tin, which is enabling something or other cache. All right, cool. So that's uh, some stuff. Actually, now, once we have this function macro, let's see if GitHub uh, will allow us to jump to the, in, the definition of this macro. Um, we get lots of uses, usages. Can I go to definition? If I hover, can I go to definition? No, I don't think so. Okay, whatever. All right, so where do we want to go? So com is probably pretty important, but I feel like autosar and um, OS are more important. And in the interest of keeping things bounded in time, I think that I will do um, I will do these directories first and then only if we have time, look at com. Okay. So here's the OS, uh, directory. We have alarm. I guess let's look at alarm. Custom types. That's probably important. Errors. Uh, 
I guess I'll ignore errors for now. Event kernel. I'll open both of these. Um, the event kernel header and the event kernel implementation. We have hooks. I don't know if that's so important. Um, interrupts, I'm going to guess, are important. Um, OS kernel .h and .c seem like important entry points. Multicore. I guess let's look at multicore and multicore kernel. But maybe we'll ignore the C implementation for now. Um, whatever OS OS is, I'm guessing that might be uh, possibly the, the main entry point. It's very generic. And then OS OS kernel. I don't know. Some of these seem very similarly named. We have semaphores. Uh, maybe let's look at resource kernels header, semaphore kernels header. Task sounds important. Task kernel sounds important. Time obj. I don't know. We might as well open the header since we're opening everything else. And then types and traces will open and we'll probably just look at them very briefly and, and close them. Okay, here's alarm. We're just um, declaring this. We're just type defing this alarm based thing. P2 var. What makes it P2? Maybe that it's arity2. And we're passing a type def. References an alarm base type. Alarm base ref type. I'm not sure what this is for. I guess um, maybe this is for getting the base type of an alarm you pass in. Uh, I don't know. Here's an alarm type. You can declare an alarm. So declare an alarm takes an alarm ID. We've got this extern const thing with alarm type and automatic. And I guess it just uh, declares the uh, alarm ID in the language of like using these macros, I suppose, these const things. If a maximum value of the system counter in tick, so I get, is this an alarm? I guess we're defining an OS uh, constant, uh, which is the max allowed value. I don't know where this thing gets supplied. It says it's extern. So maybe you define it um, in your implementation. And then the number of timer tick for one counter tick. So I guess we have a counter tick and um, uh, the timer tick is maybe like, maybe what's coming off of like the, the oscillator, like the system clock. And we are, I guess, aggregating uh, timer ticks into counter ticks, I guess. And then we have a minimum tick value for a cyclic alarm. So I guess an alarm, uh, a minimum value. Does the uh, alarm go off at least that often? I don't know. All right, here's custom types. Um, Let's see, nothing much here, but we get this P2VAR thing. What's the definition of P2VAR? Let's jump to Emacs. I have a feeling Emacs is gonna make it easier to find definitions. Uh, let's see, where are we? I think we are in OS. I think these are usages. Okay, so these are definitions. Um, hmm. Is there a fast way to find where these are all defined? TPL debug, TPL as action. Maybe if we search for um, define okay, here we go. 
So what is ret type? If we call, okay, so if this um, func, I guess it takes a ret return type in a mem class, whatever a mem cl class is, and it's just uh, going to create um, like a function declaration essentially. It looks like with the return type on the left and the mem class on the right. And I'm not sure I understand what a mem class is. Let's ask ChatGPT. That's barred. What does the C code do? Let me make sure I'm understanding the define macro um, syntax. Define, yeah, okay, so the thing that you're defining is on the left, and the thing that you want it to be is on the right. And so let me make sure also that, um, I think the opposite is true of type def, right? It's been a while since I've programmed C. Type def, uh, okay, old name is on the left, new name, new type name is on the right. Oh, okay, so that's not the opposite, All right? I'll explain the C code. Divine func, red type mem class does macro definition to define the macro name func. Yeah, using the define preprocessor director. Macro, yeah, okay. There's two parameters, ret type, uh, the return type of the function, and mem class represents the memory class specifier, indicating where the function should reside in memory. Okay, I guess that's a thing that I've never used. It translates into ret type mem class when used. This means it places the mem class specifier before the ret type. Okay. And the purpose, compiler abstraction is used in embedded systems, that's us, to describe away compiler specific memory placement keywords. Okay, because I guess the idea is that your, um, your uh, compiler, or maybe the target might have different memory specific memory placement key keywords. This makes the code more portable. If you pass it in int ROM code, then it turns into int, uh, in this example, you the specifier is attribute section dot rom code, my function, okay. Very interesting. Tell me more about memory class specifiers. Yep, so FizzBuzz is saying that define is done during pre-processing, yeah. And type def is done during compilation. Oh, okay. I didn't realize type def was done um, after pre-processing, but that is interesting and useful information. Thank you, FizzBuzz. Okay. Um, memory class specifies in C and C++. There are keywords used in C and C++ to control storage duration and linkage of variables and functions. They offer finer grain control over memory allocation and visibility compared to just relying on variable scope rules. So some examples are uh, storage duration. Automatic is the default. Variable exists only within the block, function or compound statement in which it is declared. Static, okay, yeah, I'm familiar with static. Variable persists the program's execution and retains its value even after leaving the block it was declared in. And extern indicates that the variable is defined elsewhere. Okay, so I'm familiar with all of these, except I. I guess I didn't realize uh, that you could just explicitly say automatic. Linkage, external, internal. And uh, yeah, okay, I'm also familiar with auto, static, extern, and register and mutable I've probably seen. Okay, yeah, I had, I had kind of forgotten about that. That makes sense. Uh, but it sounds like we might have exotic ones. Red, allocated. No linkage, internal linkage, external linkage. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, so that's what this macro is about. P2 var, uh, you're gonna take a, I guess, prototype or pointer type, a mem class and a pointer class. We've got the pointer type, the mem class, the star and the pointer class. And I guess the difference is 
just that we are dealing with pointers. So we have this star here, essentially. So pointer type is the, I guess, the return type. And pointer class is whatever, uh, I guess. I'm not sure. But that's essentially what we're doing. And then we have p2const, which is uh, essentially the same thing with const and so on and so forth. So this is mainly about getting the, the mem class abstracted. Um, so let me think about this. So if we have some pointer, mem class and pointers. Hey, this is almost exactly, this is like literally the same code. Zero output, somebody downvoted this, I guess. I think, I assume it starts with one. The C preprocessor is just a simple search and replace machine when it comes to macros. Yeah. So it will be replaced by um, SPI Apple data. This is the, the pointer type. Where did SPI Apple data come from? I don't know. But here's the pointer type. What do they call it in the code? Yeah, I'm in Emacs. Uh, the pointer type. And then the mem class is what? SPI var fast. I think they have this star reverse maybe. Um, and then SPI fast pointer to Apple data. Okay. I guess we're... Blah, 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 blah. Now you will need to know how SPI Apple data and SPI Varfast are defined. They seem to be macros too. So I guess this is just the name. Is pointer class just the name? Yes. Let's ask Vard again. The pointer class is the type of pointer, for example, in car struct. Pointer class is the class of pointer itself. For example, automatic type def compiler specific keywords. Okay. So like type def, I guess, might be the some keyword that you pass in under some circumstances. Okay, so that's funk and all of the that stuff we saw. OS code is um I guess just to find to be automatic. Every if if with com is yes, then all of this stuff here. Oh no, sorry. Try this again. Regardless of what what it is, with com is, um, all of these OS code, OS var is essentially are just defined to be automatic. So the old name, new name. Cool. All right, great. At least I know more about uh, what's going on now. Hello, ants. Hello, Sang. Uh, Sang Tan, good to see you. Good to see everyone back. All right. Um, okay. So where were we? Were we here? Here's machine PPC. I don't think we were here. This is OS. I have no idea what um, PPC is here. But I guess maybe they don't want me to know. Um, but at any rate, we're just defining a bunch of funks, things like try to get lock. And the funks are defined in terms of other macros. So this is the this is how they're thinking about abstracting the OS logic away from uh, the chip specific, the target specific logic. And then you implement some um, some macros essentially, I think, or maybe they're type defs. And uh, by writing it in these macros, it figures out um, uh, it figures out how to adapt their generic OS to your uh, chip. And this is trying to get some lock. And what kind of lock? I'm not sure, but I guess we have this function that um, is specifying the lock type, which is being passed in. 
And so this seems like pretty generic. And I guess let's look at one of the implementations. We have this volatile var. I guess volatile is not compiler dependent or not platform dependent. Um, we have an automatic variable, which is the default kind of variable. It's called TPL lock and uh, we're creating, um, sorry, I guess it's, it's type is TPL lock and we're calling the, the temporary variable temp lock. And then we'll try to get, the, we'll call try to get spin lock on the TPL gate lock. Is that something we passed in? I don't think so. Um, and if, if the lock is equal to unlocked lock, so presumably unlocked lock is something you have to implement uh, for your target. And by you, I mean, somebody else has probably done it if you're using trampoline RTOS on, a, um, on something they support. But if you're adding support, then you, I guess, need to implement it. Um, and if the lock is unlocked, then we're going to set it to locked and set success to try to get spin lock success. I guess, because we got the lock. Otherwise, we're going to set set success to try to get spin lock. No success, I guess. If we're done here, then we were already locked and we failed. And then um, we're going to try, if we if we grab the lock, we'll set it to locked, and then we'll set it, and then we'll call TPL spin lock on the TPL gate lock, release spin lock. Okay, so maybe the gate lock is our own lock because we're it looks like we're getting it at the beginning of this section and releasing it at the end independent what of, of whatever is happening to the lock variable so i guess this is like a level of locks higher all right so that's some locking stuff um here's more locking stuff i'm just going to move on and see what else we have Here's event. I'm going to imagine that events are pretty fundamental. Uh, event control. So we have some masks for events and a mask ref type. And we can declare an event with an event ID. And it just, I guess, declares an event using this const thing. So an automatic event mask type. That's not so uh, informative. Maybe let's look at the event.c uh, implementation, which we don't have. Event kernel.c. I'm not sure if I opened it, but let's look at the, I guess, header file first. That events of a task. So we have some task ID. I don't know what a task is, maybe a thread or a process or something in between or something uh, that's neither. An identifier of the task for which events will be set. And then we have the event, which is a mask for the selected event bits. So I'm guessing an event is essentially an int. Uh, like every event is an int and then you get some int and you, I guess, and it or something with a mask, you do some bitwise operation see if it's the event you're looking for. Um, I think that's a common pattern. I'm pretty sure we saw it recently, maybe in um, free RTOS. And then we're going to return some error value, which might be nothing, or that the task ID was invalid, which is basically a programming error, I guess. Um, the reference task is not an extended task. I'm not sure that might also be a programming error. And the reference task is suspended, which is, I think, more about the state. The, uh, of the system than about the, a bug. All right, so this is the set event service. And OS code is automatic, I guess. And so these are all automatic variables and we have some task ID and some event mask. But this is just the header and then there's some implementation. So let's take a look at the uh, C file actually. But before we do that, we can see what else we do. We can get the state of an event, waits for some bits in the event. Um, do the bits come one at a time? Or maybe the, the, you just give it a mask and it waits until it matches. It just like lets you know when it matches, perhaps. I don't know. All right, but let's look at the header, the, uh, the implementation. See if there's anything, um, uh, anything there, or if it's just you have to implement it for your thing. TPL, set event service. So here's the service 
that we was the first thing we looked at in the previous file. It takes a task ID and an event. And you're going to call get current core ID. What is a core ID? I don't know. Maybe it's a, um, an identifier that changes on every run or so. Get proc core ID, presumably some process core ID. And then uh, we're creating this TPL status variable. Uh, we're setting the, the essentially the return result to be OK. And then that's essentially a defeasible assumption. There might be something that sets it to not OK. We're going to lock the kernel, uh, check the interrupt lock. So check that we haven't disrupted interrupts. Why? Because maybe if we disrupted in interrupts, then maybe we don't get any events. I don't know. Um, whatever a store service is, but this seems like a call to some service rather than trying to get get like a get a service. Um, and so we're gonna, I guess, maybe call the set event. Set the task ID to task ID. This seems to be setting state on the store. And we're going to set the event mask to an event. Now, I don't know if the store can only do one thing at a time, but this seems like there's no, um, this isn't, these are, these are three separate calls. So you would imagine that if, if the store can do, look for multiple events at a time, you would have to call them together so that those, so that the function call could do something like assign um, an identifier to that particular request to watch for for a certain event. So I'm guessing it, it can only do one thing at a time, but who knows? Um, and then we're going to check the error level forbidden from an alarm callback. Um, okay, so we're going to, I guess, the store service might have already aired out. And we're going to check for a task ID error. Check access right. Um, okay. So I guess we like try to do something before we check if we can do it. Is that right? Seems a little bit dangerous. Next, the task is an extended one. I mean, uh, let's ask Bard. Uh, check if it's an extended task. I don't know what that means, but maybe extended in the sense that you uh, um, implemented it, extended it like as a class, and then check suspended task error. And then if our extended task count is bigger than zero, and we've got, and if there's no extended error, then we'll set the event to the thing we passed in and get a result. And if result is okay, and TPL kernel needs schedule, if the if the process I guess needs to be scheduled, then we'll um, schedule from running. Uh, core ID or nothing. Okay, so core ID must be the, um, this must be for multi-core processors. I had speculated that it was like something that changed on each run, but I guess core is probably like processor core. At any rate, we're going to schedule, uh, it looks like, I mean, that's my new theory. I, I haven't seen the implementation, so I don't know for sure. So it looks like we're going to, um, uh, from this function, I guess, schedule a thing on this proc core ID and then we're going to switch context to that core ID, I suppose. And then we're going to uh, check the result for errors, I assume, and, and presumably um, uh, execute some logic that, that handles errors if necessary. Then we're going to unlock the kernel and return the uh, result. So that's pretty interesting. I'm going to just assume that most of the other functions here are, are, are pretty similar. What surprised me though is that it seems like we're checking access rights um, after we've already like monkeyed about with this store. So um, I'm going to ask Bard what he thinks about this. So it could be that checking access rights is slow and that it's more dangerous not to get your thing scheduled for some RTOS. I'm going to start a new chat. I don't know how often you need to start a new chat with Bard. Um, tell me about this block of code. Is there anything interesting from a security perspective?
So it checks, uh, it checks for access rights, ensuring that only authorized tasks can set events for other tasks. This is crucial to preventing unauthorized actions and privilege escalation. This validation, interrupt handling, context switching. You lock the kernel, call level restrictions, recommendations. Thorough code review, security testing. Okay, so um, I noticed that What is this function called? Seems to be called after. Uh, let's see, store service. Um, after we've got the event on the store service. Um, would it be better? To check access rights before we try to change the store service. Checking access rights after modifying the store service could lead to security vul vulnerabilities. Here's why: a race condition in a multi-threaded environment, it's possible that another thread could successfully call said event between the store service modification and the access rights check. Resource consumption modifying the Store service unnecessarily consumes resources if the subsequent access rights check fails. Um, you can move it before. Um, why might they have? Put the um, access rights check after modifying the store store service. So it might be an optimization, legacy code, granular control. Perhaps the access rights check is specifically tied to the event being set rather than a general permission for modifying the store service. This could allow more granular control. Okay, error handling. Then modifying the core service first to properly handle specific error scenarios related to access rights violations. Okay, or incomplete <laughs> implementation. All right. So, um, So maybe it's, I don't know like how often this if is true, uh, but if it's not true, then it seems like um, we check for errors here, but uh, the only thing that we do after the access rights thing is, is check to see if we had an error. There's no like, it doesn't seem like we kick off the start or anything. So I'm wondering if, um, if this really is a little bit troublesome, but who knows? I don't, I don't know this code. Uh, fix error code returned by something or other. Introduced three months ago. Let's play the blame game. Uh, where were we? Some something something. Task task kernel dot c. We deleted access rights, and then like reintroduced it right. We just deleted white space, it looks like. Okay, I don't know. If you know this code, let me know. Uh, it could be totally uh, totally not a problem. Um, I'm just, just curious. Okay. Um, all right. Here we have OS event kernel dot H. This is the, the header. I think we maybe looked at this. Uh, yeah. Okay. So what else do we have? Here's kernel.c, which I think is the thing we just looked at. Internal types. Um, what kind of types do we have? We have process ID being, uh, task ID is being type deft as a proc ID. Um, core ID is a UN16. I guess you're not going to have more than Max of UN16 cores. Uh, TPL trusted count is used for the trusted counter of each process. Each time a process calls a trusted function, its counter is incremented and decremented when the function returns. This allows trusted functions to call trusted functions. The number of nested calls is limited by the size of this type. Okay, so this is 
um, I don't know if this is just bounding recursion or something else, but um, it, at least in practice, it seems like good bound recursion. And is there anything? Uh, we have some alarm based types. I was curious about min cycle before the smallest allowed value for the cycle parameter. Okay, so maybe this is not about the alarm going off regularly. Maybe it's about the um, the smallest increment that we can reason about. Right, here's some interrupt stuff. And nothing. We're just defining some if and def, uh, whatever that is, TPL OS IT interrupt header, maybe. All right. Um, interrupt kernel. We may be monitoring the stack. We're uh, declaring a bunch of a bunch of uh, uh, vars, and a lot of them seem to be locks. And uh, they, uh, you essentially get a vector of the for you get a lock um, for every number of cores. Task lock, I guess, for, for each core. Rather, um, each core can specify whatever the locking depth is. Maybe whether the locks are like re-entrant or whatever, or maybe nesting. Um, we've got functions for getting the lock status. If true equals get lock count for core. We're going to look at the core's lock count. I don't know uh, if that means, uh, I'm going to guess they're uh, locks on the same level as opposed to nested locks, but I don't know. And, oh, get uh, interrupt lock status. We're looking at lock task locks, task lock OS, and task lock all. And if any of them are true, then we're true. Otherwise, we are false. Oh, user task locks. These are, I guess, user locks. These are OS locks, I guess, locks controlled by the trampoline RTOS people. And whatever a user task lock all is, I don't know. Something along those lines. You can suspend all interrupt services, resume all interrupt services, and so on. And those things are guarded by, by locks. TPI, TPL null it is just going to null some stuff, I guess. An empty function. And we're, um, I guess, casting foo as a void. But we're not returning anything. Okay. TPL, TPL activate ISR. Okay. I don't remember what ISR was. I, th I think we saw it before, but I'm just going to move on. I'm going to ignore OS kernel, OS kernel C. Multi-core, I'm going to guess is just you have multiple cores. We've seen what happens with one core. Uh, Multi-core macros, I'm going to ignore. OS, OS, I don't know why there are two OSs. We have a status type. That is information for many services. Value names are usually prefixed by EOS. Okay, declare application mode. The application mode identifier. I don't know what an application mode is. Okay, uh, we'll ignore these OS kernel. I'm guessing these are um, kind of more of the same. All of this code looks pretty similar to me. Start OS service. So this is going to start, I guess, the OS service. Let's look at this. Um, we'll get the current core ID. I guess that's probably the core we are running on, I would suppose. Um, check some error stuff that can possibly be extended with a hook, I assume. And then um, we're going to call the store service with the start OS command, I suppose, and set the store mode to mode, which is uh, the mode that we passed in when we asked to start the OS service. And then if we have more multiple cores, then we might have a sync barrier at the start of the TPL start OS service. We have some some barrier that will, uh, I guess, allow us to synchronize the cores, and then initialize the OS to the mode, enable counters, call startup hooks, which I'm guessing are user, user extendable. According to the spec, it should be called after the OS is initialized and before the scheduler is running. And then we call the OS application startup hooks if needed. So more hooks. Uh, if we have multiple cores, then we're going to sync the barrier uh, before starting the scheduling. And then we start scheduling. 
And I'm kind of curious about scheduling, but I think I'm more curious to get to the car stuff and see where we are. Where are we on time? We're about an hour in. Let's see if we can just jump ahead to the car stuff. Here's semaphore stuff. I think we've seen semaphores elsewhere. Uh, are tasks interesting? No, not really. They're just I think those are just the IDs. Maybe I can find schedule real quick. Schedule request. Yeah. You know what? I'm not a, really a fan of the, the GitHub uh, search I found. I've been using it pretty extensively uh, the past few weeks. And it's certainly not as great as uh, as as code search, as Google's code search. But um, even there, I feel like it's often dominated by Emacs or grep. Um, okay, so here's Autosar. And is Autosar the only automobile stuff? Um, we have Goyle, which I'm not sure I remember. That, that was some specification by the people who made Autosar. So that's maybe just like a compiler. I'm gonna ignore the com directory. Um, TPL AS definitions. We've got counters, I guess let's look at application and app kernel. And action. TPL as GT kernel. I, I guess as, I'm reading as is like as, but it's really Autosar, right? So GT, I don't know what GT stands for. Um, Memprot, Protec, Sketch Table. Let's look at Sketch Table. We have some spin lock. I don't know what ST kernel is. Lack monitor. Oh, stack monitor. That's not so interesting. I mean, it's semi interesting, but not that interesting. Has trusted fact. All right, let's look at trusted fact. And maybe timing uh, protect. I guess, I'm guessing timing protect is timing protection. All right, so let's just do a, a quick look see. So here's TPL as uh, AS Autosar definitions. So these are just going to be definitions, I guess, for the spec. Schedule table auto start absolute. Is gonna we're gonna or together whatever time object auto start is in this flag. So uh, auto start relative, auto start synchron. So I guess these are different ways of starting this um, this application. Whatever uh, I'm guessing you implement uh, you use this to implement a in like auto start application, but actually. Let's take a quick look at the Wikipedia entry to see what sorts of things it's used for. Basic software. Software modules mostly with no explicit automotive job, but offer services needed to run the functional part of the upper software layer. So like cups, if your car has a printer, that, that, that might be a service that, that you can expose. A runtime environment middleware which abstracts the network topology for the inter and intra ECU information exchange between application software components and between the basic software and the applications. Then an application la layer, which I think is where we're closer to, um, that interact with the runtime environment. Classic platform. Uh, let's see if we can find a trampoline, Artos, Autosar examples. I know there's an examples directory, but uh, maybe blog. A to Z guide on Autosar. I just want to see if there's anything that like I can see as nope. This is like telling me about. I don't see if anyone's gonna like do like a hello world. Autosar hello world. It won't help you to be familiar with the concept. You require the following things. Know about Autosar. Oh, whatever. 
Walk through this tutorial. Nope. All right. There's nothing that comes easily to, to mind. Uh, well, maybe I can ask. Um, right. And Autosar. Give me an example of an Autosar application. A powertrain control unit in a vehicle, PCU. Okay, so maybe like control systems, maybe like the battery battery controller for an electric car might be auto SARized. All right, and then we have schedule table. These are like, I guess, what is the status of a task that's that's been scheduled? It might be stopped or running uh, next or waiting. Maybe this then will return the next schedulable thing, or maybe it means that we are scheduled next. I don't know. Uh, running and synchronous, and then bootstrap and async. Okay, so those are different. Uh, these are essentially enums, but they are in practice uh, defines. They seem to be flags. Um, and we have things like an identifier for the ISR object, um, autosar ISR. Interrupt is synonymous with interrupt. Okay, so uh, autosar is interrupt according to that thing that I saw just now. Um, we have things like uh, spin locks and type count, the number of object kind, access read. So there's some kind of access control. I'm going to guess it might be relatively minimal since this was defined long ago. When was it defined? Oh, it was formed in 2003 by the Bavarian Motor Works, more commonly called BMW. Okay. All right, here's an application. And what? We've got the object type, which can be a task, an ISR, which is an interrupt, I believe, an alarm, a resource, a counter, or a or schedule table. Uh, we have an application type, I guess is like an ID, object access type, return type used by check object access. I uh maybe that's the like access decision i don't know uh, it returns a un8 so there's not a lot of uh variation restart type object type etc application state ref okay so lots of un8s and this is this is just the header but do we uh did i open the, the um c file see if the c file is any more interesting Come on now. No C file. All right. Maybe you have to, maybe it, that's for you to implement for your, uh, for your application. Okay. So here's the app kernel. And again, I think it looks pretty small and we have some functions though. This is essentially like an interface. If I, if I'm understanding how this thing is laid out, um, we have this get application state service, allow other OS applications to access an OS application after restarting. All right. And then uh, here's a function that calls the startup hook of all OS applications. And we can also call the shutdown hooks. And every, oh, this is the kernel. So the, the kernel can call the, 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 start up and shut down hooks because the kernel, I guess, is control of the startup and shutdown. I thought for a second this was saying that any application could force all the other applications to call their startup hooks, which would have been insanity, but that's not at all what's going on. Okay, so the kernel is mainly has a bunch of hooks. It can get some service, it's got some service getter. It can uh, terminate the application service. I'm presume, assuming it can start the application service. Um, and we've got other services like an ownership service, but it's like relatively small. Um, here's an action. Um, we've got the increment counter action structure. This structure adds a pointer to the counter, to a counter to the base action structure. Okay. So we've got some base action and a callback function pointer. Adds a pointer to a counter. 
Um, I'm not sure where the counter fits in, but this seems to be mainly adding a callback for an action. And then we can increment the action counter. Finalize schedule table action structure. Where are we? This is an action. Um, so we have a base action and a callback function pointer again. All right. And that's about it. We can, let's see if this one has an implementation. And maybe the implementations are for you to implement. Okay, we do have an implementation. So let's look at the finalized action, the finalized schedule table. Action function for action by finalizing the schedule table. The schedule table is finished. Test whether a schedule table has been nextified or not. Okay, a TPL action star is cast to a TPL finalized schedule action uh, table action star. This violates Misra rule 45. However, since the first member of TPL, TPL finalized schedule table action is a TPL action, this cast behaves correctly. I wonder what Misra rule 45 is. Extensions with pointer type should not be used in what? In what? In the plus, minus, plus equals, and minus equals operations. All right, what is Misra? Vaguely recall being aware of what Misra is. Motor Industry Software Reliability Association. Okay, so we're violating the software, the motor industry software uh, thing, but they're saying it's okay. It's a little bit sketchy. All right, so we're gonna, um, I'm not sure why it's doing this. It seems like maybe it's doing this casting um, to kind of indicate to the type system that something is done which is a little bit strange, a little bit cool, if that's really what it's doing. All right, so we're gonna uh, do this, whatever this finalized thing is, then uh, we're setting the schedule table to, um, I guess the static part of the schedule table. Static meaning, I guess it's uh, finalized, possibly immutable, or maybe just uh, static in the sense of a, of a static, uh, function. Um, this is another rule violation. This TPL time object star is cast to a TPL schedule table star. This cast behaves correctly because the first member of TPL schedule table is a TPL time obj. So if this is important to the authors of this program, then presumably they should have some, some tests essentially that uh, if you make a change, the source code, that makes this invariant not true. So for example, if you change the first member of, of TPL schedule, uh, schedule a uh, table, although I think this a uh, is a typo, um, but basically every, everywhere there's one of these, there should be some rule that makes it a compile time violation to make certain changes. And um, if that's not there, then there should at least be a, um, like a, a test that, that runs on every commit that, that makes sure that that, that that invariant is true because this seems to be essentially a safety violation. And the safety violation is redeemed, if I'm understanding correctly, by the fact that um, currently, at least when this was committed, the first member of the TPL schedule table is uh, whatever, the, whatever the thing was, the, the non-schedule table version. Um, but really that that should be enshrined in code in some way, in my opinion. Um, I lost where I was, but but that's fine. Yeah. And this just seems to be doing whatever this casting stuff is. Got this TPL tick before, got some uh, action description, uh, getting the next expiry point. And then if we're down here, Get the remaining time to fill the current schedule table period. This time is stored in the offset of the first expiry. So uh, before it's gonna be set to the schedule table expiry at zero, the sync offset. Then we're gonna reset the cycle of the time object. 
and then reset the index, which is another, another miserable violation. We'll set the index to zero. And if next is not null, that means we have some next. This, uh, if next, the synchronization is forgotten because it's like a changing of mode. So if we do have a next, then we're going to set uh, the st state, is st schedule table? I assume so. We're going to set the schedule table state to schedule table stopped. So we're going to stop the schedule table, get the next expiry point. This doesn't say it's a rule violation, but it seems to be stopping progress. Like, what if there's a crash here? Uh, I guess, I don't know. Um, then we're going to get the next expiry point from the schedule table static thing, the static part. Check if expiry point at offset is equal to zero. Yeah. If there's um, an expiry point at offset zero, maybe that means that we were expired now. Then we launch all actions of the expiry point. Okay, then we iterate over the um, the next app count and call all the next app actions. Action desk. Is this, I thought this is action descriptor. Maybe this is desk means something else. At any rate, um, we use action desk to uh, get the underlying action. We pass in action desk to it. Why? I don't know. That seems to be what we're doing. And then we're going to increment the index because the first one has just been launched. Check the next expiry point, which is expiry at one. The, uh, okay. There is a next schedule table set. Start it. And we're going to get next, which is different from next EP. We've got next here. We're going to look in, inside of next, we're going to look at the bdesk.date. What is bdesk? I have no idea. And we're going to set it to next bdesk stat part counter of the current date plus the next expiration, next expiration's offset. So whatever b is, we're setting its uh, date, which I'm going to guess is mainly really a time, because I don't know how many auto SAR applications span multiple days unless your vehicle is running 24 seven. Um, but we're going to, uh, whatever B desk is, we're going to set essentially its date to the, uh, next expiration offset plus whatever the current date is of the static part. And then we violate misery again with the casting. And if we're down here, I don't know where this if started. If next is non null, I guess is where we started perhaps. Um, if we're done here, then we check if the schedule table is periodic. Okay, so these are like periodic actions, I suppose. So if the, and then uh, we do more offset stuff, launch all the actions. Okay, so that, that's similar from before. Um, and then we're, if we're down here, then we check whatever Apple data is. We seem to be setting its index to negative one and reset the state of the current schedule table. Um, Apple automotive. Apple car, is it coming? I don't know. I thought it was just delayed. Group AAPL. Plastic engineering. What about Autosar Apple? I don't know. I'm not sure what Apple is, but something. All right, so here's, whoa, 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 where were we? This is the same function. I just opened it twice. GT kernel. I have no idea what it is, but I'm gonna skip it. Oh, uh, is this Goyle? Goyle something kernel? Um, whatever this is, we have some more schedule stuff. This function is called after a schedule table has been started synchronously and the synchronized time is provided to OS. Uh, more misery violations. 
probably around casting. Yeah. Uh, this is something for computing the start date of the synchronized schedule table. We have a function that's called when the schedule table has been started asynchronously and the synchronized time is provided to VOS, etc. Uh, lots of schedule -y stuff and all of that's fine. And I'm just going to plow along. Here's the schedule table function, or rather header. We've got a type, a status type, and a ref type, and we can declare a schedule table to the implementation. Negative. All right. Here's the a, the ST kernel. Maybe ST is schedule table. Synchronization strategies. Schedule table no sync, implicit sync, or explicit sync. So I guess um, I don't know if we have multiple tables that we're syncing or or what exactly we're syncing, but we're doing scheduling, so somehow synch synchronization is involved. The minimum of two values. This is just a min operator. You can adjust the next expiry point. Here's a structure that stores information about the synchronization scheme of a schedule table. It's just some essentially kind of like a setter. An expiry point. This structure put together a time offset, the number of actions associated with the expiry point, and so on. And I'm just going to scroll through uh, and ignore the rest. So lots of scheduling stuff. I'm sure that's actually uh, pretty interesting. Um, as far as scheduling is concerned, but I don't think we have the time remaining to to really dig into um, the the details of how exactly scheduling is is working. And we've seen enough of the use, I think, of it that we have a that we have a good sense of how it would work if we look if we looked closely. Uh, I don't know what fict is trusted. Oh, these are the trusted functions. They have some counter. Um, you can declare a trusted function. All the trusted functions. You give it a trusted function ID, a pointer to the parameters of the trusted functions. Maybe something checks the parameters. I don't know. And you get a result, a, a return type. Here's the trusted uh, function kernel. And uh, Look at the C implementation. Here's called the, here's this function to call the trusted function service. And it's going to get the current core ID and the uh, TPL kernel for the core. I guess TPL is trusted something or other. And look at the status. And we'll look at the trusted function count. And if the um, index is less than the function count, then we will. Uh, look into the trusted function table and possibly increment the counter. Call the trusted function with the index and the parameters. And then decrement the counter and return uh, and get the result, I guess, and return it. All right. That's about all I care about for the trusted function. Timing protection. We've got some um, timing protection watchdog that has some state, like is it active? Uh, the last start date of the watchdog, the budget. So we've got some error budget that is, um, maybe it's maybe the error is time timing slippage or something. Like if, if you're supposed to go every 10 uh, microseconds, and you go 11, maybe it increments the budget by one or, or, or something along those lines. The watchdogs per process, I guess four. All right. Uh, we have some execution budget, a resource lock, all interrupt lock. And here's a struct. We've got some times, some TPL times, the last activation. Some bulls. What are the bulls for? I don't know. Um, the first instance initialized to true to change the behavior of the time frame watchdog for the first instance of a task. Okay, so that's the thing that you can change um, if you want the first time a task runs to be treated differently. And then you've got a list of watchdogs. 
uh, and you, we've got some expiration. You can reset the watchdogs, whether to terminate on wait, and so on and so forth. And here is the tinyprotection.c. DAO assert. I don't know what DAO assert is. Uh, but you can set it, set the IDs, etc. Reset the activity. Activate or release. I don't know. I don't know uh, where the actual implementation is. Maybe the actual watchdogs are um, are hardware. Uh, perhaps keep the the task is started. Its active watchdogs shall be started to. Okay, so this is, will wake up the watchdogs. Uh, by I guess checking the is active status. If it's active, then we'll set the start date to now. And um I guess we'll set the remaining time to uh if you watch dogs of C remaining will be the uh, oh oh we're checking at the the remaining time on the watchdog C as we're iterating over it is less than the I guess minimum ID, whatever the minimum watchdog is that, that it has remaining, in which case we're going to set the new min to be C. And then we'll set the watchdog ID and we'll set TP watchdog and return true. So if the task is stopped, the watchdog stopped too. And then we've got some uh, expiration stuff. Very cool. Um, and that's just about it. I had a question in my mind. I, I can't remember exactly what it was. Uh, it was something about, um, the schedule tables and the, um, and schedulable stuff, but I don't really remember. We, we didn't look at message passing. Um, I'm sure message passing is, is, um, important. We didn't look at examples, but now that we've seen some of the code, I'm wondering if there's uh, any, any examples that are, that are going to be super interesting or do we know, I want to see if there's a car example is really what I want. Covering TC Nucleo. Read button, trace, serial, blink. Let's look at the blink oil. So here's the oil implementation. Uh, We've got a task. It looks like this is declaring a task with this, um, the default stack size of tasks, um, the default stack size of ISRs, which I think are the interrupts, and then CPU blink. Blink, I think, is the name of the example. So this is like a user supplied name. I don't know what the CPU uh, keyword does. Maybe that's kind of the name of the, of the chip. Then we have some. OS configuration, we're gonna set the status to extended. Paint stack, true. Paint registers, true. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what painting is doing to the stack into the registers. And then we're setting like the trampoline base path. The source code is set to blink.c. The app name is blink.exe or blink underscore exe. Uh, and we give it some like linker and compiler flags. System call, true, I guess if we're making system calls, some memory map information, an app ID, an alarm, uh, which is the blink blink alarm, I guess. And we're using the system counter and uh, we're gonna activate the blink task and set auto start to true with an alarm time and a cycle time, both of 100. Cool. This should be just debug information, right? Okay. Then let's look at blink.c. It's really simple. Um, we're going to define the, the, I guess, function main using the OS Apple code. And main is going to initialize the user LED. Uh, we're going to call start OS in the default app mode and then return zero when we're done. Uh, and the init user ID is going to set the pin mode to this pin, which I'm going to guess is the um, the pin for the, for the LED, uh, I guess set it to three and output, uh, what is output? Maybe that means like set it to output mode or something like that. 
then the blink task um, is, I guess, it's going to be like an asynchronously running task. And um, we're going to set uh, this GPIOB, which is the, the, the pin, I suppose. We're going to set its ODR to be the result of, um, this is XOR, right? So we're going to XOR it with, uh, we're going to XOR the current value of ODR with GPIO ODR OD3, which will toggle uh, the user LED. And then we're going to terminate task. And I assume this runs continually. Uh, I don't know how it stops, but maybe that's specified in oil. Cycle time is 100. Maybe the, um, Maybe cycle time is, is what specifies it. Maybe it runs until you've killed it. I'm not sure. Let's see if the readme says anything. A simple periodic example, which toggles the green LED LD3 pin 13 of the board. Have a look in that. Blink.oil file. Uh, one millisecond SysTick system counter. So we saw the 1000. So, uh, sorry, 100. So I guess 100 is one millisecond. The task blink toggles the green LED when executed. This is not scheduled when the program starts. The task is activated by the alarm blink blink. This alarm starts 100 milliseconds alarm time after start OS. This alarm has a 100 millisecond cycle time. So I was wrong. Uh, the, the 100 was 100 milliseconds. And so uh, this has an alarm and this alarm kicks off after 100 milliseconds. And then every 100 milliseconds, we're going to send the alarm again. And the, the, um, the LED task, uh, waits, I guess, for the alarm. And when it gets it, it executes the toggle. And then we should see somewhere sys tick is like one or something. Tick. One. Task link is priority one. Activation is one. I'm not sure if any of those ones configures uh, this one millisecond thing. Okay. Well, that's that's enough for now. That's Trampoline Artos. We will be back on Friday for our first evening, my time at least, uh, stream which will be on Kubeflow Pipelines. Hope to see you there. Thanks for watching.